Well, welcome everybody and thank you for coming to our inclusion study group again. Um, today, we're going to have hopefully a variety of voices talking about experiences with the term queer and how that might have changed over our lifetimes. And I just was thinking about that myself and thinking that when I was a kid growing up in New England, it was quite common to hear somebody say, oh, that person is queer as Dick's hat band, but it didn't mean anything except that they were odd. And I was trying to remember the first time that I heard queer as a slur. And I think it was probably in grade school in the 50s, maybe. Uh, and it took me a while to figure out what, how the, that word had been twisted to mean that. But I don't really know uh, that much about the history of it. Uh, Steve or Don, do you have anything to fill in the gap there? Well, um, I grew up in the South, uh, Alabama, Selma, Birmingham, and West Virginia. And the word queer was something I remember very on in the 50s, uh, especially in um, as I was getting older in junior high school. That was thrown around. I, you know, I heard the word sissy. I mean, this was directed towards me, sissy, queer, light in the loafers, um, faggot, of course, that was not unusual, but I also heard ter ter terms like in, of endearment, like, well, one of these days you're gonna make some woman a good wife. Now, that, those kinds of daring words of endearment, you know, were backhanding to women and to gay men. I mean, obviously it was misogynistic and, so queer was just one of those words I grew up with that, you know, was not affirming as who I am as a, as a gay man, but it was definitely, as I got older, I moved to Salt Lake City and in Salt Lake, I was very conservative with the Mormons. And I grew up where that word was never heard. I never heard that. I mean, rarely would I hear that in Salt Lake, but, um, you know, in the South, more obviously used. Rick or Don, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, um, the word queer is a pejorative to me. Um, at least it was growing up. I'm, I've done a lot of thinking about it since we had our first meeting um, recently. And, um, you know, it, it brings up naturally started or immediately as Steve brought it up, um, bring up a lot of conflict in seed inside me as to whether or not I could accept that. But um, over the last couple of weeks, I've, I've looked around it um, around me in a greater community. And I've looked back a few years at things I've read. And I find that the, the, without me knowing it, the word queer was being used more and more commonly. And I also came across something about, um, about language and the evolution of language on the planet and how important it is that we have these changes in language, that it's absolutely a living beast. And, and the more I look at it, uh, I don't think there's any one one thing that is big enough to hold all of us except the word human. And yet within that, there are all these little categories that we've got. And in the, in the sense of, of queer, I, I, I see it from what I'm observing is, is a broad category to welcome everybody in who fits on a, a spectrum of, of personal gender identities and social gender identities. So, um, you know, I, I've never felt comfortable with it. And yet that's what I've always been. Uh, I've always, you know, early on when I, when I first realized I was, I was attracted to the same sex, it was seven years old. It was in first grade. I remember my first crush and, um, and when I was 13, I came across an article in Life magazine. I think it was Life or Look, one of those two. And it, and it described the uh, gay scene in New York. And, and it was 
not a not an affirming article. And uh, when I put that down, I realized that's what I am. It used homosexual for the first time. And I said, but I'm not supposed to be that way. So that was a, a lesson I learned early on that said, okay, you d don't be different. And yet um, my whole life and my spiritual awakening, my spiritual life, uh, my professional life as a clinical chaplain, supporting people is to honor the differences in people, to recognize that there are no two um, like beings anywhere in the world. We are all queer in the broadest sense of the word, but specifically for this purpose, um, I think it, I, 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 I'm, I'm certainly am coming to the place of acceptance that queer is a good term and it's a good one to claim. And so um, I, let's take it back to the old English or the older English version of what it was. It was just a normal word that described something that was different. So um, I, I don't know if that's, I guess that's enough to start the conversation. And uh, um, let's see where it goes from there. Thanks. That definitely can start the conversation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. How about Eve, do you want to chime in? I know you have some thoughts about this. I have... I'm going to keep my comments really brief. First off, Rick, um, good to see you, maybe meet you. I really want to you know, connect with you about spiritual awakening as being you know, really tied to one's identity. You know, I, I think that you know, was my experience and was one of the biggest surprises of my transition. Um, I think that when Steve talked last time that we met, you know, about using queer. And I would, you know, you know to me, I, I would say this is the queer elders group mm -hmm. and, you know, or the queer elders family group, because, you know, that way we include, you know, people we're associated who may not identify as queer. But when Steve spoke last time about his history and, you know, recognizing the work that ACT UP and others did back in the 80s and 90s. And that to me, queer, because that was such a central part of that, reclaiming that word, that, you know, I believe that in a real sense, what we call the LGBTQ plus movement or the pride movement or whatever is really owes so much to those activists. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, that in a real sense, the where we started. Because the AIDS crisis really brought both gays and lesbians together because lesbians were a huge help to the gay population. And it's sort of interesting that we've always separated that, that each, you know, every, every initial is actually a separation. Mm -hmm. And that by being inclusive, we are always, you know, defining ourselves by these subgroups. And so I am really comfortable with calling it queer elders or queer elder family group, either one. You know, um, I think it's important that it be queer elders and I think the reason for that is that when I was talking to people with um, in a group that I work with, Rainbow Crew Northwest, they, they were surprised that we would use, you know, the word queer. And they were surprised because they didn't have any trouble with it. But it was their view, their view, their view was that people who remember Look in Life magazine you know, do have trouble with it. And that they would avoid it, you know, using it, you know, out of deference to the elders. And I think that the elders claiming it and being the ones that put it out there is really important. Because it's, you know, honestly, every time I type, you know, we, we support the LGBTQ plus movement I realize well some people are going to say I didn't put enough letters in some people are going to say I you know put too many letters in yeah. some people are going to say what does plus mean you know um 
I, I'm really more comfortable just writing queer right now. And I, I really thank Steve for that. And that's my sh supposedly shorter view of, you know, and contribution. I'm sorry I went on a bit. <laughs> no, that's great. Thank you. I, I love the queer elder family group idea very much. Um, and yeah, my kids look at me funny when I say, is that a okay, acceptable word to use? They're like, well, duh. I mean, it's the most inclusive term. But for so many of us, we grew, lived through a bunch of different versions of that word, and it isn't so easy. Steve, you've spoken before about really being on the front lines fighting for the right to use the word queer. Do you want to say a little bit about that? Well, when I worked at the health department, uh, and we created uh, the nonprofit organization called Gay County, and that was back in the late 90s. Uh, and I took it upon myself to use the word queer in identifying queer bingo, which was, a, as I said last time, was a huge hit. Once a month, we draw anywhere from two to 250 people in the basement of a Episcopal church in, in Bremerton. And so queer was not um, taken uh, lightly uh, in using that term. And I got a lot of pushback, I have to tell you. And it was, guess from the elders, people over 60 years old, you know, said, so I would, you know, I really feel uncomfortable using that term. And I said, well, of course you do. That's why we're using it. We're trying to empower ourselves and take the sting out of those words. Like, I mean, even faggot, uh, that's not being used like uh, queries. I mean, I, since we met last time, I've gone on YouTube and looked at everything I could look at, queer versus the, the term LGBTQ plus. Uh, and there's a lot of debate in that, but the debate, basically the, the debate is queer is okay to use. And, uh, and I've been using it for, again, since the late 90s, so that's been 20 plus years in the public with the gay community in a conservative neighborhood of Bremerton. So I don't know what that says about Bainbridge. And I guess that's why I suggested that we use it for Bainbridge is that we are a little behind the times in regards to the national scene, I think. So pushing that word queer on Bainbridge Island, I would love it. <laughs> I would just love it. <laughs> Well, it was kind of your rallying cry back in the day, wasn't it? We're here, we're queer, get over it. Oh yeah, here. we're here, we're queer, get used to it. Get used to it, yeah. Yeah, I just think it's so interesting because Bainbridge is really a very progressive uh, community in many ways. And yet, I think sure. partly it might just be sort of an issue that we have quite a bit of uh, elder population here. And many of them also remember when it when queer was considered a slur and maybe have less contact with younger people who consider it to be just a very broad descriptor and perhaps the most inclusive one. Um, but it's it's refreshing to me to think, yeah, why can't we carry this forward and say, you know, again, we're here, hello, get over it, hello, but you're welcome, right? The one I mean, that element that, of welcome is, is, I think, important too. Yeah, I, I like the welcoming of it. And what I really like a lot, and, you know, because I was having this conversation with my cousin who's of you know same age as I am and she shies away from using you know she's you know straight cis you know, gender you know, woman and out of respect she shies away from using the word queer and I had to tell her honestly I can say queer her niece who's you know lesbian can say queer but she's not supposed to say queer the way things are right now. And I would really like it if she could use the word queer. And you know, I think that we're not just serving ourselves by using the word queer. We're liberating you know, that level of carefulness that other people have when they're addressing us. And I think that that's also essential because queer is inclusive. Mm -hmm. And people, when they say LGBT, they start you know, flipping out, you know, non-queer people start saying, oh my God, am I getting this right? 
am I, you know, including the letters right? Do I have them in the right order or whatever? That, you know, it really is a separation. And if we use the weird word queer, first off, we are elders, therefore we could do whatever we want to do. Uh, <laughs> and um, second, it basically starts giving other permission, you know, gives other people permission to use the word. Could I add one thing? Yes. Uh, yes. Just, Think of a young woman or a young boy that's 13 years old living in, God only knows, some country area of the Midwest. He's walking down the street and a carload of boys yell out the word queer, queer, or other terms. And the boy looks at him and goes, yeah, yes, I am. And it's not a derogatory term when you use it so frequently that it does take the sting out. I mean, I've been that little boy of 12 or 13 years old and got called that. And it doesn't, it doesn't bother me now. But for that young man or young woman in the Midwest or somewhere in the country where it's more conservative. Hey, it's it not in the Midwest. Midwest. <laughs> it would help take, take the sting out a lot make it more normal. And like I said last time, there's a little queer in all of us, straight or gay or bi or whatever. Oh. Well, from what I understand from the kids, and I'm sorry, most of them seem to be on vacation because several of them were interested in attending but are not here. Um, but there's still slurs. There's still, uh, you know, there's ex more acceptance and there is still pushback. There is still bullying. There is still uh, targeting. And right here on Bainbridge Island, not, oh, just, yes. not just the Midwest or not just the South, um, mm. but definitely not only in Bremerton either, that um, I think we really need to confront this kind of sorrowful piece of our own cultural history right here. Um, right, right next door, it could be there. We don't know. Well, uh, and this is where I'm going to turn to some of the younger people here. And that, you know, for me, means just about anyone. Um, <laughs> because there's been the expression that I know was current, you know, 10 years ago of, of, you know, teenagers turning to, you know, disapproving of something and saying, oh, that's just so gay, right. you, know, at, you know, in a pejorative kind of way. And I don't know if, you know, where things are right now, but I'd be interested to hear. Well, Annika, do you, do you feel like you could speak to that a little bit? You've been working with some kids recently. Yeah, um, of course. I think that I think that saying like, "Oh, that's gay," as a pejorative, like how how you're referring to Eve, I feel like it was something that was a big thing, especially sort of like in the early two thousands, like when I was in which is when I was in elementary and middle school, just to like date myself. <laughs> um, but I feel like now, of course, there's still bullying and, um, you know, young people say horrible things to each other all the time. Um, but I feel like that specifically isn't quite as common. And if it is, it's more in that sort of like middle school uh, humor, like um, immature, like there's a, Im a very immature connotation, which I think is in part because uh, there was a lot, I, I remember like campaigns specifically about not using, not calling something gay to mean something bad, like when I was in school. So I think that, that those, those things probably, um, played played a part in that too well if, if i could ask because i think that i'm making the assumption that we here are a safe place and that we here need to be free to say words that we ha wouldn't normally say so annika what are the bullying words now you know, can you just, you know, rather than just saying there's bullying and there's awful things said, what are the awful things? Because we have got to be able to know what those are. 
Yeah, of course. I mean, obviously, I haven't been in like high school or like a traditional school environment in quite a while. Uh, but we have been working with youth. And I think that part of it, um, it depends on like the community that you're in and sort of how vocabulary is used in your area and your community. I think in some ways, there's maybe less like, uh, or at least for me, the types of bullying that I notice, because in some ways, I think that they're, that it's more, can be more damaging is stuff where it's not just about calling someone a word. It's more of like a general discrimination against who they are or ostracization um, based on someone, you know, being different, looking different, especially, you know, maybe when uh, you're young and you don't necessarily know um, who you are, you're not ready to come out and say like, this is my identity, but you know, other people can tell that uh, you know, maybe you're experiencing things in a different way or expressing yourself in in a way outside of the, the mainstream. I don't know, Kristen, do you have, I see your hand raised. I'm wondering if you have some. Yeah, please. Uh, Kristen. Yeah, I was just going to say um, that I, I really love this conversation in part because I'm really thinking a lot about how words have power and um, words have, and our choices of words have meaning and how mutable language is all the time in this equity work that we're all doing. And I think that one of the really damaging things having, I have two kids um, who have graduated from Bainbridge High School in the past, I don't know when my son graduated, he just graduated from college. So within the past five years. And I think that a lot of things that happen there have to do with microaggressions and um, making assumptions about people and, um, and then coming to a conclusion based on an assumption and also this kind of, um, I, reflecting on what Anne has said about Bainbridge, I think that one of the really lovely things about Bainbridge is our close community, but it's also a really suffocating thing where people, um, you know, don't want folks to move too far outside of their expected troughs of, you know, their regularly trodden paths. And so um, having one child who is gender non-binary and was um, only really felt comfortable coming out in college away from Bainbridge um, has been a good lesson for that. And I just want to say, I want to take this moment <laughs> Um, to personally come out. Um, this will come as no surprise to people who know and love me, but, um, and I've come out to my, my close family, but um, I've been thinking a lot about how important it is to be, I'm 53, and um, I've known this for my entire life, but have only recently felt comfortable really bringing it up as a conversation piece. And I'm, you know, more in my homophobic self, um, really struggling with that. But um, as when I came out to a dear friend of mine who's gay, he said, how come you, you know, why did you choose to say bisexual and not queer? And so I, again, Eve, I really appreciate that queer as a um, unifying, um, unifying term and um, so I think that just thinking about um, ways in which words are powerful, people can claim their power by using words that um, are both empowering to them, dismantling of um, you know, structures that have used those words for negative reasons, and also um, enjoying the plasticity of language and really um, making room for all kinds of people to coexist and being curious about them. So I appreciate this being a safe place to come out publicly for the first time. And I um, thank you. Thank you all for accepting me. <laughs> you're welcome. Oh, oh Kristen, you're wonderful. You're wonderful, Kristen. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> You know, it is true. I think that if uh, if we look closely, there is a, 
we're all on so many spectrums. It's, you know, rainbow world, right? I mean, when I was growing mm -hmm. up, there was, there was geek, there wasn't even sort of geek, there was just weird. You were weird or you were this or you were that. And we didn't have a lot of choices or options lined up for us. There weren't role models or as uh, several people pointed out, if there were, they were not positive ones. And sort of there was no invitation to explore and really not even an invitation to explore in, in much more mundane ways. Like if you were a smart girl, well, my gosh, you could probably be a secretary or a nurse. <laughs> it, it, there weren't it, the world was smaller and I think it's just fascinating because only after my own daughter came out to me as transgender I started learning a whole lot more and realized like I personally would identify as gender neutral and I didn't even know there was such a thing um but it's really comfortable it's like oh yeah that fits really well because I never really felt like a real woman in so many ways and if I put on earrings or something I was like this feels like Halloween to me um and so finding that there's this huge spectrum and you can fit yourself on it and it might change over your lifetime. I really understand the kids who are gender fluid or uh, just gender non-conforming. And in our transfriending group, we've seen kids move from one birth sex to another and then kind of retreat from that feeling like that wasn't really, really they were and settling on being trans. Just like, yeah, I'm trans. And what a comfort. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not to say it's always comfortable and it's not always safe either, but what a comfort that there is a landing place and you know you're not fixed to it, pinned like a butterfly to a, you know, collecting. Yeah, those, those, you know, th th those butterflies that you pin are dead. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> do you I realize, had, um, um, oh, go ahead, Steve. I was just going to say, do you realize how important even this discussion is compared to, let's say, 40 years ago oh, yeah. or 20 years ago, how educational we are being by educating the general public to talk about all these topics. And we're back when, and I'm, this is not poor me, this is just reality of coming out as a 12 year old boy realizing I was gay, who was I going to talk to? Not my parents, not my minister, not my rabbi, not my teacher, there was nobody safe back in, in the early 60s to talk to. Now it's like, yeah, well, so? I mean, it's not in every community, like I, like we said, it, you know, it, it could be next door to someone we live that's homophobic or transphobic, whatever. Um, we, we are making a big difference just by talking and using the word queer. I and that's... I really thank you for that, Steve. And, you know, when was it Ann or, you know, whoever said before that, you know, maybe we're a little bit behind the curve. I actually think we're ahead of the curve in that we are elders talking about using the word gay. I mean, using the word queer. And that I would like us to have a even larger, I think that one of the things we could do as a group is to promote this discussion on a larger scale I would like to, you know, get some other, you know, national elders, so to speak, you know, and, and say, hey, we're using the word queer here. We are, we're talking about queer elders, not LGBTQ elders. Right. And we think that this is, you know, if, if you're all waiting for us to die off before you start using the word queer, please don't, you know, you know wait. We, we sort of want to hang around a little bit and you know, feel that we're really making a contribution. And I think, Steve, when you, know, when you brought that up, I was completely surprised. The last time. I, had not, I had not thought of that. And you know, to me, it was like, oh, yeah, that's kind of a danger word because I don't know exactly where, what's the appropriate thing for that. And, you know, but what you said really made an immediate impact on me. And that I think we actually are ahead of the curve just having this conversation. Dave, I, I would, uh, um, I know that in New York, they use the term sage um, for the elder group um, in the, um, the gay community center there, and it's gone nationwide. But I think in, in my couple of weeks of contemplating this, the thing that stood out for me too is how do we bridge this communication with others in the community, especially the, uh, the younger generations. 
And uh, Kristen, I consider you one of the younger generations, <laughs> and certainly uh, from my point of view anyway, but even younger than that, how, if, if we set an example, we're, we, we name ourselves, we sit here, and there isn't a big issue about it, we just, and we invite inquiry um, between ourselves and um, make it safe for other people to actually talk about the topic, then I think we're, we're setting an example for younger generations um, who really are setting an example for me right now, telling me it's okay to use this language. And in fact, it's an important thing to us. So I'd like to support early younger generations as they continue to explore themselves as well. And so um, more and more, I, I, I think it's, it's um, the idea of a queer elders family group is just a, a, a great way to do it. And can I ask a question? Sure. Is this um, specifically elders? group or is it a family group i mean what what are we uh, so some of you may be starting to realize that you're walking into the middle of a conversation right. uh, i see rita just a sec um we are starting to meet as a as a group and i guess we're going to be <gasps> the elders family group meeting on the first fridays of each month so G july 2nd two to four at the senior center and you're all very welcome to show up. But the initial idea, and we just have had a couple conversations about this with a various group of people. Um, the idea really is that A is for ally and allies are welcome too and family members are welcome and friends and neighbors and interested and curious people. And part of the reason that I wanted to really create an ongoing group is because when we were doing an earlier inclusion study group and several of you were participating, uh, there were a number of high school kids and teachers present at that particular meeting. And when one of the elders asked the high school kids, what do you need from us? The response was, we want to hear more of your stories. We wanna connect with you. We wanna find out how you did it. How did you get through? Uh, mm -hmm. And I feel like that reaching out to other generations is really important. And so one way that we think we're gonna be able to do that would be through um, having events like potlucks and picnics and maybe coffees or whatever, um, and also putting on programs periodically and fostering conversations like this one, which soon I believe we were going to be able to do it in public again, which will be great because in person, you know, this is, I've really come to admire Zoom and appreciate the way it goes, but I feel like in person, something can happen mm -hmm. that really can't happen like this quite, right? Uh, so yeah, it's a family group, it's a friend group, it's a whatever, ally group. It's an, in, who's ever interested and open and willing to learn what the people behind the letters, I guess that's part of it for me. But our, little name, our little name here at the, at the place on Waterfront Park is the Bainbridge Island Senior Slash Community Center. So uh, yes and yes, Steve. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Rita, you had your hand up. Um, well, when you first started this, you'd said, you know, when did you first hear queer? And I, I remember in, I think it was in grade school or maybe somebody said, oh, that's queer. Like, like an idea, not like a person, like that it was something kind of different, not bad so much as just a little different. Or you could say that's, that's just a little queer. But, and to me, to me, queer is a much more, I would say, respectful um, term rather than all the letters. And that's just me. I mean, I'm a straight woman, but but to me, that is just so much more and so much more inclusive. And it just includes everybody that's here. So you don't forget everybody. And to me, that's just, I would much rather use, say, queer than than all the letters. And that's just my, that's just my opinion. And you identify as a straight woman? Yeah. And would you say there's a little queer in you? Oh, absolutely. Thank you. I, absolutely. <laughs> okay. I'm just I can testify that Rita has some queer ideas, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so that's all I had, I, that's all I had to say. I think this is a great discussion and, you know, and really, as progressive as Bainbridge seems, I think it can be very 
can, can be very stifling yeah. for a lot of people in a lot of different situations. So that's not, that's it. That's uh, my two cents worth for now. <laughs> Marla, do you have your hand? Maria? I mean, sorry. Yes, Maria. Uh, um, yes, I feel like I am entering a conversation that's already happened. I'm coming from a very different place. Um, I'm an academic PhD, critical studies, and I'm here to defend the word queer and queer theory. And so when I saw that, I thought, oh my gosh, this is really interesting. Um, I would say uh, this is when you first became acquainted with it, uh, this would have been in the, in the mid eighties, a lot of academic articles on queer theory, big shift. We're here, we're, you know, the, the saying, uh, uh, very fancy theory from the French post-structuralist, Michael Poffo <laughs> and, and Eve Sedgwick, all kinds of people. Um, but I, I, what I wanted to add was, is that at some point I taught a critical studies course you send them a critical studies, uh, it, it, it became a unit, you know, because you had the different, you know, we got Freud, we had to teach all this stuff, Marx, we did all this stuff, and queer theory became a unit, um, very highly respected academically, used the term, but my opening lecture for the unit on queer theory was, and Steve, I think I'll appreciate this, on the blackboard, I would write blank V blank, and then I would draw a, a continuum, and that's the shift to, a, to looking at um, the continuum, you said we're all queer a little bit. And that was like the opening of the lecture was now we're talking about a continuum. Uh, but there's tremendous amount of um, uh, work in the academy. I know it's boring. It, you know, you never want to read Michael Foucault, trust me. But <laughs> queer is totally, it was totally acceptable. I don't know when I first put it on my syllabus um, and, and switch my critical studies course, but I would say probably mid 90s. So it's been around long time, good term, very solid uh, in cinema studies. That's all I have to say. Thank you. I like Thank Foucault, you. but I'm a nerd, so. Hey, who, who said that they liked him? Annika. Me. <laughs> oh my gosh, okay. And, and, and I, I read Foucault and, and yet survived. That's because I forgot <laughs> everything I read. But Judith Butler and Teresa De Laurentiis, there's a whole solid, solid, solid uh, body of literature on queer theory. And, and the switch was from this idea of the other, you know, uh, versus to, to working on the continuum. And it, it, it makes a lot of sense. It certainly made a lot of sense for me trying to explain uh, a lot of the parts of queer theory. And, and, and for me, I would say, you know, I always say, look, in the early 90s, there was no word transgender. Right. So, but the fact is that critical studies had already been using the word transgender since the late 60s. It took a long time for that word to filter in to become part of the culture. And we're taking this word that if you look at movies in the 30s, queer does not necessarily have anything to do with you know, gender, sexuality, or what have you. It's more you know, what Rita was talking about. And, you know, but it became this thing you know, of you know, getting, you know, sla you know, slamming, you know, bashing gays and stuff. And we're, you know, I, I think Stephen's right that Steve's right that um, you do prefer Steve rather than Stephen, right, Steve? Steve is fine. Um, that reclaiming, you know, realizing that this word does have all the meanings that we want it to have. And then Maria, I really yeah. think that that was just really well put and made me feel really old and stupid. So, uh, <laughs> you gotta learn it, you gotta earn a living somehow. I chose a professor. Critical theory, yeah. Critical yeah. theory, yeah. Kristen, let's, uh, I just, I, I love this conversation and I love how braided the academic and the practical are in, in this conversation and how, um, I just wanted to say that, uh, well, I wanted to tee it up for Annika to talk a little bit about what's happening at the museum right now, but I, I did want to say that we are anticipating a, a really wonderful exhibition coming up um, next year, um, Molly J. Vaughn's work, and Molly is a trans artist who is focusing her work on um, chronicling what will be called Project 42, but will be 21 instances of the 42 representations of 
trans women who have been murdered. Um, and the it's a it's a very beautiful exhibition. Um, her work is is very aesthetically beautiful. Their garments and screened um, like repetitive patterns. Like uh, you can actually have your own designs turned into fabric. And so um, she's used spoon flour to create these fabrics that are sewn into garments and all these things. So I just wanted to say that we are going to be hosting a festival um, in advance of the opening of the show. And I have um, stepped in as the coordinator for that while we're going through some staff onboarding. And we're hoping to really um, take advantage of the, I mean, a friend of mine said, you know, if you're not do, if you're not at risk of being fired from your job every day you go to work, you're not doing enough for equity. <laughs> so <laughs> the approach I'm taking <laughs> right now, and um, I would love to. I mean, I I will plan on attending the um, the first Friday meeting, but I think this would be a fabulous group to be represented and um, co-coordinating some ideas for that. So I, I wanna make sure that we're amplifying in every way possible. The museum really is in a lovely position to take these, take a bunch of issues and reflect them back and also to bring people into the shared creation of rather than us, I mean, like we can think we have a million great ideas, but um, it's way more fun when other people have their ideas shared out, so. And, and if I can give a shout out for the museum, um, four years ago when, when uh, I was uh, first putting together the Bainbridge um, Transgender Day of Remembrance, the museum, you know, Greg, Robinson at the museum was incredibly helpful and has been really supportive. And we had Molly, you know, as one of our speakers. We had Marsha Botzer as, you know, and, you know, um, others speaking at our, you know, days at our, at our events. And the museum has been totally wonderful. And this Friday they do a pop-up on LGBTQ um, work and and you know in the community so you know stop by friday or you know during the week afterwards there because they, they are just really supportive and have been just you know, to me you know, a lifesaver over and over again as as i've worked on you know done my work so there <laughs> Well, you just did all like my little spiel i would give about um what's happening over there better than I even could. But um, yeah, uh, we have a, a little pop-up exhibit up in our orientation gallery right now. The museum is free as always, and it's the exhibition is gonna be up until July 9th. And it is a sharing of words, stories, um, perspectives of youth and um, adults and elders and our community because uh, partially in response to some of the discussions that have been happening at the senior center and desire from young people to hear the stories and experiences of older people and vice versa. And um, yeah, I would just like to invite all you to come and uh, there's quite a few people who here who participated. So thank you so much for that. Um, maybe after your Friday meeting, you can all head down. <laughs> And, and, and Annika, you're supposed to say the museum is staying open late on Friday, so oh. that, you know, the first Friday. Thank you. Yes, it's staying open late for first Friday until 8 p.m., so right. extended hours. And we Thank have you. air conditioning, if that's still necessary. <laughs> so it sounds like a field trip is in order for us, right? Before we have a few more minutes, um, I wondered if Don uh, looked like you were going to speak a little earlier. Would you like to jump in? <laughs> to, to say today, but um, I really appreciate and enjoy what, what's in, unfolded from our initial discussion, what, three months ago or something like that. And I hope it continues to be carried forward. I think it's really important. You know, I'm somebody approaching 85 years and can live through, you know, the 50s and the, the really difficult times coming out as a 
as a gay man in, in those years. So this is heartwarming to me to have this conversation going on now. Thank but, you. How do we want to wrap this up? I'm taking it. Everybody's going to be there Friday. We can <laughs> have a field trip to the museum, then do First Friday Art Walk. It sounds like a solid. Actually, that is why we were thinking about scheduling our meetings on First Fridays from two to four at the Senior Center, because it seemed like it'd be an easy way to go have a drink or something and walk around and see, do the art walk. Uh, if you were already in town, for one thing, you might as well stay and do some more. Um, but I love the idea that the museum is also open then and we could um, start incorporating a museum visit into our, uh, our First Friday ex experiences.